Welcome to Mission to Grow, the small business guide to cash, compliance, and the war for talent. I'm your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we'll bring you experts in accounting, finance, human resources, benefits, employment law, and more. You'll learn ways to access capital through creative financing and tax strategies, tactical information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, and people strategies you need to win the war for talent. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. Enjoy the show. 2024 Employment Law Updates. Welcome to Mission to Grow. I'm Mike Vanoy, your host. And today, my guest, couldn't think of anybody better, our dear friend, uh, regular of the show, if you watch, uh, Mary Simmons. Mary is the Vice President of HR Compliance at Assure. She's a SHRM certified professional. Also, for the past eight years, Mary has been an adjunct professor at New York Institute of Technology. Prior to Assure, Mary was the Director of HR Consulting for a 58-year-old HR consulting firm in New York. Mary, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. So uh, happy 2024 to you. Um, lots, of, lots of big legal changes on the employment front. Before we go any further, uh, if someone was to, to only maybe catch the first minute of the show, what's the one thing that employers really need to understand about employment law changes if they're serious about, if they're truly on a mission to grow their business? Yeah, thanks for that question, Mike. I think it's, and I think it's a good one. I think business owners are always thinking about auditing maybe their accounting systems or, you know, looking at the machinery if they're a manufacturer every year. But you also have to look at your HR foundation and everything in it. So not only the compliance and whether you're in compliance or not, because that doesn't just happen in January, but are you, set to have your HR function support you in your growth, right? Do you have succession planning if you're going to grow, you know, your your staff, right? So if you're promoting somebody, do you have somebody to to backfill them? Are you doing training if you don't so that the rest of your organization can continue to function as you promote people up and onwards, right? How, what's your compensation plan look like if you're going to be expanding? So there's a lot of considerations on the HR front that employers need to focus on. And I always just think the beginning of the year is a great time to do it, right? You're setting up your SMART goals, uh, looking at your HR foundation should be part of that. Yeah, and you know what? We'll we'll probably save for another show some of the some of the more productivity oriented people stuff, uh, and and we'll 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 we won't trick the audience here. You know, the title is twenty twenty four employment law updates. Uh, but clearly, if you're going to grow your business, you're not going to do it by yourself, probably, unless you're a solopreneur. Your early days, uh, you know, you're you're going to need the help of people. So, do you have the right people on the bus? Uh, do you, do you have any blockers that you need to get off the bus? Do you have the right competencies identified in, the, in all the HR practices that, that come after that to make sure that you have the team that can really build your company? Um, so with that, let's, let's jump to the, to the legal updates. You and I have talked many times that yeah. one of the mega trends is that uh, HR laws, employment laws are continually being fractionalized, not just from the federal, but down to the state to the city, to the county, to the local municipalities, these laws layer on top of each other. There are literally hundreds of updates. We could never cover all of them, but, but let's get into the big ones. Uh, it, certainly they're at the federal level, uh, the, the, this first one. What are the big employment law changes that have either been enacted or are going to be enacted and they're going to really impact everybody here in 2024? Yeah, and, and it's a great question as well. So one of the biggest pieces of legislation that's hanging out there, I think it's really the biggest um, legislation on the federal level that's come down in at least three or four years, is that the Department of Labor is looking at the white collar and highly compensated salaries and looking to increase them April of this year. So, look, we don't have definitive... um, information on this that it's definitely going to go through. Um, During the Obama uh, administration, they tried to have this go through um, and it failed. 
Uh, but I really feel strongly, just my advice, that it will go through in April. Yeah. And if it goes through in April, Mike, it has significant impact on many, many businesses. Let me give you a great example. Yeah. When I'm helping with um, the employers that we uh, assist with employment laws, uh, there's a lot of states that don't have a lot of employment laws. So you know that when you and I are talking about um, the changes, and we're going to talk about some uh, later on here, we're always New York, California, Washington, Colorado, right? We're talking those states with heavy employment law, right? Yeah. We're not normally talking about North Carolina, South Carolina, Iowa, Florida, right? right? This DOL change will have significant impact on those states that have not increased their minimum wage, their hourly minimum wage, uh, above the federal $7.25, or they've only inched it up a little bit. And the reason for that is because if their minimum wage is that low, their white collar and highly compensated salaries are probably low as well. Yeah. So so it's going to be significant. Now, when I talked about, you know, employers looking at their HR functions, a Fair Labor Standards Act audit should be done in the beginning of the year every year, right? Yeah. Um, but this year, it is very important that it's done. So, you know, this change is significant. Those white-collar exemptions, of course, are the executive, professional, and administrative exemptions. And they're currently sitting at $684 uh, a week, which is 35500 and change a year. Okay? Yeah. It's, it's going up significantly. They're proposing that it goes up to a little over $1,000 a week which means it'll be 55, a little more than 55,000 annually. That's a big difference, Mike, for a small business. Mary, I, I'm, I'm going to pause for a second. Yeah, so, it's so, a lot. So, so folks who have been, who are regular watchers of the show, you know, they, they've seen this. Uh, if you haven't heard this before, I encourage you to go jump back into prior episodes. You and I have talked about this because there's an exempt versus not exempt classification. There's the exempt, uh, exemptions for that classification um, topic. There is the, certainly most everybody knows minimum wage. That's pretty straightforward. But very few people, I believe, know about the minimum salary requirement for exempt employees. So if you're exempt, that means you're exempt from overtime. So you're a salaried person. There's no such thing in the eyes of law as a salaried person. You're an exempt employee. Uh, a lot of people just don't realize that there's a minimum you must pay people if they're going to be an exempt employee. And that's what's going way, way, way up here. So, Correct. Right. So I encourage everybody to check out prior episodes. We go hour-long deep dives in these topics. We're going to do a bunch more between now and April 1st as things become clearer. But just so everybody understands, this thing was, was put into... So rumors all 2023 that this was coming. End of summer, early fall. Okay, the, the DOL publishes the draft of the rule. And it, it, it says it explicitly. So you go from a minimum salary for an exempt person of $35,568 a year to $55,068. It's like massive increase that you would have to pay all these it's huge. Now, it went through what they call the comment period, right? It's gone through the comment period. And now what we're hearing is it's going to be implemented April 1st. Something could happen, could delay. We're in a crazy political time frame right now. You know, it might get phased in, but as of right now, everybody should be thinking this is this law has this rule from the DOL has gone through the comment period. They've signaled that April 1 is going to be the date. You should be prepared for this thing to hit your desk April 1st and be ready to deal with it, regardless if things change downstream, because this is that big. I, I'm not overstating this, am I? You're you're not overstating it. I mean, listen, I I just want to mention, I'm sure if you're in the States, where this won't be as big of an effect being, you know, New York and California who, who already raised their um, salaries for white collar. Um, 
it's not going to be as big of a deal. But for the states that have not increased that on their own, the federal edict will be huge. It'll be a big impact. Um, there really, we will go over this again, Mike, because there is just so much to unpack here. And yeah. I just want to make sure that employers are prepared, understand how it affects them, what yeah. can they do to protect themselves, et cetera. I, I've been having lots of conversations with business owners here. Uh, and, and I think there's maybe a, 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 it's easy to think, oh my gosh, the government is going to make me give everyone massive raises. So, so let, let me, if you're in a, if you're in a high end white collar kind of environment, uh, you, you, maybe you don't have many employees uh, that are exempt employees with a salary under 55,000 anyway. So maybe this doesn't impact you, but think yeah. about huge industries. I think the estimate is like 3.5 million employees can be impacted here. Maybe, maybe your retail, maybe your hospitality, um, uh, right. yeah, you're, you're some type of manufacturing. A, manufacturing where you are an exempt employee, you're on salary, but your salary is less than 55. To give everyone raises from 35 to 55, it would probably break most small businesses. They just simply couldn't afford it. Right. So, so uh, I, I think what, what people start to realize and business owners I've been talking to is, whoa, this is not so much, it is a mandate in the, in, 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 in the minimum salary. But what this is really doing is forcing me to put exempt people as hourly people and better understand what these exemptions actually are right. for exempt status uh, in the first place. Can you say more about that? Am I hitting on something here? And how, how do you think people should be thinking about minimum salary versus just correctly classifying people as hourly? Yeah, I mean, listen, we that's one of the first projects that I'm going to do with an employer. Uh, after the handbook, we're going to probably look at job descriptions, which are going to drive your exemptions and make sure that people are classified correctly. Um, and, you know, understanding that salary can be the biggest expense, especially for a small employer. This is a big deal, and that's why we try to plan for this. What are the raises going to be this year? What's the impact on the business? Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other things you have to consider with this. There's going to be some compression, right? Because your middle manager might have been making 36000 Now you got to bring them up to fifty five, and their manager was making fifty five. Right. So you don't need to increase the manager's pay rate, or do you? Uh, are they going to want to quit because now the person they supervise is making the same amount of money? So you really have to think um, very specifically about that, about this. What we literally will do is we do a full payroll run and a full uh, Fair Labor Standards Act audit, which has a lot of different um, pieces to it, and figure out, you know, what's going to be the cost. And, you know, I, I also want to mention, and I, I, I think our listeners probably know this, Mike, but a lot of states' minimum wage also goes up in January. So that's something I also want employers to remember, that January usually makes the, the minimum wage, your, your hourly worker rate, go up also. So this all of this is going to have a huge impact on employers, and I want them to be prepared for this, both financially, but also from a cultural standpoint, how are you going to communicate this? Big time, because uh, you hit on the head, there's there's the compression issue. So I have a manager who's got a salary of 36, another one who's uh, who's got one of 55, and all of a sudden now you're getting paid the same, you're going to have to deal with that. So either yep. you're going to give the level two manager a, a raise or... Or are you going to put, and so that'll have issues, either budgetary or psychologically or both. Um, the, the manager who is sitting at, say, the $36,000 salary, $37,000 salary now, if you put them on as a non-exempt employee uh, and now they're paid hourly, this is, this is probably going to be one of the hardest things, I think, for employers. Just psychologically, there's something culturally, maybe not psychologically, culturally, where people are like, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm salary now. I, it, it feels like an, a milestone in their career. Now, a lot of times they quickly realize, boy, I'm 
I'm working a lot more hours for the same damn pay. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what's really driving this to make sure employers aren't having a manager who makes $36,000 work 80 hours a week, right? Exactly. They're ensuring they're actually going to get their overtime. But the cultural Agreed. issues around going from salary to hourly, um, then the budget issues, do I give them a raise or do I take them hourly? Uh, and by the way, you have to qualify for the exemption. You just don't get to just choose that. But then you're going to deal with the overtime. And if it's the overtime, am I better off just hiring another person? There's a right. lot to think through. There's a lot. There's a lot. And like you said, we're going to prepare employers, you know, those that we support, we're already preparing them. Um, but we're going to you know, have other uh, webinars on how to prepare for this because, like I said, this is literally the biggest piece of legislation coming out of the federal government in three to four years. So, so it's I mean, a biggie for most. The biggest thing since you know CARES Act kind of PPP uh, ERTC kind of employment law leave types. I mean, I, I agree. This is probably the biggest thing in three years. Yeah. Uh, Let's speculate just for a minute about implementation here. Let's move on to some of our other topics. This is the biggest, so it's, it's right that we're spending this much time on it. Yeah. Uh, what What do you think happens April 1? Is this binary boom deal with everybody? Do you think this could get phased in? What What, what do you think is going to happen here? From every indication that that I've read and continue to read and try to keep up with this, I do believe it's going to be, you know, not phased in, um, which is sort of counterintuitive, right? The states normally, when they increase the minimum wage, uh, they've been phasing them in if that minimum wage is going up significantly. So I'm a little surprised by that. Um, so that may change, right? So we're still a little bit in the dark about exactly how this is going to be, um, what the go forward, you know, strategy for, for the DOL is. But every indication I have is, you know, sometime in April, it's go time like that with no phase. Yeah. In. Back that in could change. That could change. Back, back in September, I was predicting that this would be because this is such a big move that uh, some lobbying entities would get to Congress and say, hey, go influence do well here. You can't the system can't handle this all at once. I expected through the comment period there to be something come out about a phased implementation and it hasn't come up. So I know I'm shocked. I, I, I think there's a chance still, um, but Agreed. I think you're right. I think, I think employers need to be prepared. And by the way, there are different laws that apply to different size businesses, right? So if you're, you're more than 20 employees, you've got to now comply with uh, uh, Cobra. You've got more than 50 full-time employees, the Affordable Care Act. There's, there's different thresholds. Some laws, federal laws, it doesn't matter how big or small you are, right? OSHA, you got to supply, provide a, a safe work environment. Minimum yep. wage, one employee or 100 employees, you got to pay the minimum wage. This is one of those. This is yes. FLSA. This is exempt versus non-exempt. This is the minimum, a minimum wage for hourly, minimum salary for the exempt employees. It doesn't matter if you're a, a one or two or five person company. This applies to you. Agreed. That's yeah. why it's it's so significant. Yeah, right. All right. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned. Future episodes of the show, we'll, we will talk more about this topic as we learn more and we approach the April 1st uh, deadline. Let's, let's move on. Uh, I, I think you look, gave me seven kind of major themes here for yeah. uh, one that law changes in 24. What's, what's the next one for you? So the next one that I wanted to talk about was non-compete. Um, and, you know, I, know, I realize this doesn't impact everybody, but non-competes continue to be challenged. So what happens in a court of law is that the judge is going to say, hey, Mike Vinoy was a uh, salesperson for Mary Inc. And he leaves. He has a non-compete that says, you know, he can't do any kind of sales for anybody uh, in a certain regional area that was similar to what he was doing for Mary Inc. And what actually the Department of Labor has has been ruling is that Mike has the right to make a living. And you were, um, you know, so severely, you know, um, handicapping his 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 ability to make a living 
with that non-compete. So that's what's being challenged in the courts. Um, California has basically banned them. Uh, very, very hard to uphold in New York, I would say. Uh, you know, they're, they're basically, you know, all, almost banned in New York. Um, and it's just really making um, it difficult for employers to keep their market share, right? Um, so, you know, listen, this is how I would recommend that we prepare for this. Number one, uh, again, great time to look at your non-competes, have those non-competes reviewed by a professional, right? You're not going to see your blind spots if you wrote that non-compete. Um, so or you really need to have Google. it looked at by a professional. You, what were you saying? I'm really sorry. Wrote, or you copied it off of Google. You're not going to know your wife. Right, right, exactly, right. Um, so, you know, you also want to, you know, have open conversations with your employees, right? So the first, your first line of defense is keeping your employees happy and engaged. And I realize that people are always going to leave for various reasons, um, right? They need more money, et cetera. But if we're keeping our employees happy and engaged uh, and they don't leave, then this is going to be less of an issue. And even if they do leave um, and understand, you know, you know, that, you know, they don't go directly after your clients, um, but maybe go after, you know, ancillary clients, I think it, it'll make everybody a little bit happier. But I think that having a professional look at your non-compete. Uh, do they feel like it'll have any traction whatsoever in a court of law, right? And then if it needs to be adjusted, you know, you need to talk to a professional about that as well. A non-compete normally should be given at hire. Very difficult for this type of a condition of employment to be given um, after hire. Uh, edits would be um, acceptable in most cases, but again, this all needs to be looked at um, by professionals, and you need guidance from professionals to work through these because each state is going to have a different nuance on non competes, uh, and that and you know that's kind of what we're dealing with, right? Because we support clients in you know multi states. Um, it's different in almost every state. I haven't seen two states look at this the same. Let me put it that way. The old adage, uh, train your employees so they're qualified to go anywhere, treat them uh, uh, so that they will never want to leave you, right? That's exactly. all starting good. You should do that. That's, that's a great principle. The reality is you might have trade secrets. You might have, uh, you might have a great sales process. You might have great uh, messaging uh, and strategies in your marketing and how you go to market. You might have, maybe it's not, maybe it's not patented, uh, but you might have manufacturing processes that are unique and give you a competitive advantage, that, an advantage you don't want out the door. Uh, knowing that these things continually don't stand up in court, uh, and I think that trend is just going to continue, right? The it is. The continuum is clear. Power shifting from employer to employee, that has been going on for 70 years. It's not changing. It's going to keep on going. What practical things should employers do or think about when it comes to non-competes? Yeah, I, th I think I think I um, hit most of the high high points on that. But uh, you know it, that that non-compete's got to be looked at by a professional and on an annual basis, minimally. Um, and are you going over that non-compete with your employer employee? Right, they might have signed it ten years ago, Mike. I really do feel it's important to to cover it with employees, especially in the states where it may have a little bit of traction. I would go over that with employees in a very positive way, right? You don't be like, don't lose, don't leave me because you have a non-compete, um, right? Not in a threatening way, but you know they should they should understand that um, in 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 a positive way again. Uh, you know, that's that's what we guide the employers on, right? Uh, having positive communications. Um, and I think that, you know, if you work that way, right, how am I going to keep my employees engaged so they stay? But if they leave, uh, is my non-compete going to hold up 
I think that's the best way for you to prepare. Yeah. And so, and I, I, I didn't ask the question the way I probably uh, meant to. Um, you're not advocating that people abandon this saying, oh, can't do non no. anymore. You can still do them, but they're Too way bad. more nuanced. It, it, so it, it's, it's A, get a professional opinion on uh, do we think this will stick or not? You can't guarantee anything, but do we think this would stick in a court or in, in a hearing? Uh, and then two, presentation and communication matters as you talk to employees. How is it that you communicate these things that, hey, I'm not trying to hamstring you. I'm not trying to prevent you from feeding your family. I hope you never, never leave us. I, I just, agree. I want you to help me make this an amazing company. And I want to, I want to beat the competition and I want to, I want you and I to do this together. I want to make sure that those, those, those advantages don't leave the building, so to speak. So th there's agreed. Good. And now I sort of know what you were asking. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so let me, I'll give you a quick story. Um, I, we, we had an employer that was asking us about the non-competes. We reviewed them together. They looked pretty good. Um, <clears throat> they were not in New York or California. So we felt pretty comfortable, but you know, what I'd like to ask the employers when I'm working on a project with them is, you know, what are your concerns, right? Why are we looking at these? I know why I'm concerned about it, but I want to know why you're concerned about it. And what came out of that meeting, Mike, was that they had one top salesperson who owned their biggest clients. And so when, when we talk about preparing, and I'm glad you, you, you dove a little bit deeper, my suggestion is, why is only one person the point of contact for your biggest clients, right? Your biggest or clients should have as much handholding and as much contact with as many people at your organization as possible. And that will make it a lot more difficult, right? Even if you didn't have a non-compete, they should be doing business with Mary Inc. versus doing uh, business with Mike Vinoy. So that was our advice for this client. We created an SOP. They changed some of their account management practices yeah. and felt a lot more secure that those big accounts weren't going to walk out the door if that, that uh, you know, rainmaker, that best salesperson uh, walked out the door. That's really smart advice. I like that, Mary. So yeah, in, in the olden days of, I don't know, a decade or three ago, yeah. You might say, okay, my, I want to hire account executives. Your job is to develop deep relationships with the uh, primary contact in the, in the, in the people in our, in our biggest accounts. And that's how you would guide them. And right. then, you would, and then you put the, the golden handcuffs on them and say, oh, by the way, non compete, you can't call on them. So uh, you protect yourself as well. Some of these, some of these changes in HR law is not about the transaction itself. Uh, uh, non-compete, good or bad, or you can do it, you can't do it. This is a language I can or can't use. You really should be thinking about your entire business practice. So yeah. if these are not as enforceable as they used to be, maybe your strategy isn't to assign account execs who develop these deep relationships by themselves and you develop more of a team approach. How do you That's touch right. And 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 it's a derivative of the change in HR law not just a strategy in and of itself. So that's, I, I really like that. That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just add one quick other thing. When I do compensation, so another organization, we restructured their compensation plan so that um, their sales reps got money um, in perpetuity or for five years, depending on the type of account it was, rather than getting this huge payout when they bring the client in, they... They lowered that, and then year two, they got some comp, year three, year, right? So they were incentivized to stay at the organization to continue getting compensation from that account, but also they're compensated to, um, you know, engage in some account management responsibilities and stroking that client and keeping a good relationship with that client so the client doesn't leave. Well, yeah. It worked really well for that, for that second employer. Yeah, that's great. That's great. All right, let's move to the next one. Uh, the federal government, I'd say on a national stage, there was a public debate, right, about uh, privatization of, of 401k, uh, privatization of uh, uh, Social Security, 
good or bad, lots of commercials of pushing old ladies off of cliffs and wheelchairs. And it was a very, it was a visceral public debate, right? Yeah. Yes. It hasn't happened for a very long time, but the federal government is acting and states are acting to ensure folks have retirement set up. Yeah. It's right. Helpful. So it, so it's no longer. I think this is no longer a national debate. There's a, a we, we've done episodes in the past here where we talk about federal tax credits, uh, but the the states are doing something here around retirement. Could help, help unpack this next one for us. Yeah, and I you know look, I like to look at everything from you know how is it a positive for the employer and. Number one, if you're forced to have a savings plan, now this is something that I'd put on your ads when you're attracting right. um, new employees to get the best talent. It'll help you keep the best talent. And it, it's a great benefit for your employees. So I, I do think that even though you may be in a state that is mandating this, and as an employer, you might say, you know, yikes, how am I going to do this? I think you want to look at the positives, and I do feel um, like there are some positives, not only for the employees, but for the employers. Um, starting January of this year, we're up to 16 states that are mandating a savings plan. Uh, some of those courts, <laughs> New York, California, but Vermont, um, Illinois, uh, Washington State, Massachusetts, um, or make up some of those 16. So it's, it's not, you know, just New York and California. And Mary, I think what's in, sorry. In, important to note, 16 have enacted legislation. I want to say it's something like 32 had this on the docket in 2023. So this isn't just, okay. It's not going to stop here. Posts and I, you know, I'm in the, I'm in the middle of the country. This isn't going to impact me. The majority of states are looking at some type of a retirement plan mandate for employers. Yeah. And, 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 you know, again, one of the other things about this piece of legislation, sometimes there's legislation passed, Mike, and, you know, what I try to wrap through with employers is, look, it's your choice. This is what you have to do. And a lot of times I, I have one employer in mind, he used to go, well, what will happen if I don't, right? He always wanted to know, you know, what will happen. Well, sometimes there aren't fines. For this, these mandates, these fines are hefty. Um, and so it's not just you should do it. <laughs> um, it could cost you some real money if you don't do it. I, I will say that, you know, New York and California have state um, savings plans. They might not be so great, but, um, you know, it's just managing it. It, it, you know, there isn't a, you know, a large cost at all. Right. So I, I don't think employers need to, you know, be super nervous about this, um, as far as costs go, but you do have to work with a professional to see, you know, what plan is best for my organization. If I'm going to have to do this. Uh, what plan should uh, should I use? I want to be in compliance, but you should also be looking at you know what's best for your industry, your um, employee population, and your organization. Your path to growth. What makes the most sense? So I think you really do want to uh, prep for this. Talk to a professional. Don't have a knee jerk reaction. You do have to <laughs> adhere to this if you want it the states that mandates it, but please plan for it. Um, don't make it a knee-jerk reaction. Make it, uh, if you're going to do it, uh, do the plan that makes the most sense for your organization and, and again, your your path to grow. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So this is one of those things that, uh, we, we, so uh, this is a service that Azure provides. So uh, it is, is 401k retirement plan service. We, we talk to employers literally every single day, they don't provide any retirement plan and they live in a state that this is mandated, but they don't know about it. This is not, a lot of states have, have, they haven't done tons of enforcement yet uh, and or they haven't done a lot of marketing and promotion and awareness about the law yet. And so uh, when I think about how an employer could address this, of course, you don't get to choose whether you follow the law or not. You got to follow the law. So you, if you're if you are required to provide retirement benefits, 
most states provide something in the form of really just it's a Roth IRA. Um, it's a uh, it, 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 in a lot of employers kind of stop there. Oh, it's a mandate. Okay, I'll just do that. They'll pick take the, the state plan. Yeah. But now you don't have a competitive differentiator between you and the and the employer across the street. Right. right? If if you just without a ton of extra work, by all means, we'd love if you call us, but call anybody, call Fidelity, call anybody else in the 401k business. You can offer better. So if if, if you and your competitor are, are, are competing in the same talent pool to, to get the best employees to your business and your competitor is just using the state mandated IRA, which isn't great for the employer, it's not great for the employee, and you're offering a rich 401k plan that has tax benefits to you and the employee. Uh, at, at, forget about the the financial benefits of, of 401k in general. There's a lot of ways that you can improve your employment brand and help attract employees by leaning into this mandate. You might hate it, but lean into it and use it as a competitive advantage versus just everybody signs up for the state. Uh, I right. Agree. I agree. Yep. You know? Absolutely. All right, let's move on to the next one. Pay transparency. What are, what are the changes that are happening in pay transparency? So this, this is definitely a trend that I see catching on in more and more locations. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, but listen, my advice to prepare for this is to just embrace it. <laughs> right? I don't think it's going to get reversed. I don't think it's going to go away. And I'm going to be honest with you, when we're talking about the war on talent and trying to get the best people, you know, in the seats in your organization, it does make sense to give the salary range that you're offering for the position. It's going to save you time, right? So you don't have somebody who's applying for the job. You know, I was just hopping in employment the other day. They wanted to pay about a hundred thousand. Um, they posted that in the ad. Um, and you know, it was it was super helpful because the person that they really wanted, you know, to apply for the job that they were sort of talking to on the side wanted 200000 twice as much money. And I'm like, well, good thing we didn't, you know, go through the whole, you know, process and then find that out. The person right. self-selected out. And so, listen, just embrace it. Um, you know, my advice, even if you're not in a state that mandates pay transparency, I would um, put those salary ranges on your ads. I would, you need to update your applications, Mike, because you cannot ask for past salary. You can ask for um, their salary requirements. So what are they looking for um, right. on an application or, or in an interview? And I, I would say that this is one of those things that, Please do some training. So we're really big on doing interview training, right? Interviewing for success, but also staying compliant in those interviews. So your managers also need to know definitely in the states that mandate the pay transparency, just because you, you have to put the salary range in an ad doesn't mean, and you adhere to that. When you get in an interview, you still can't say, Mike, what was your last salary? So your managers need to know that. Talk about big fines and lots of lawsuits. There, I've already had um, more than one employer uh, be sued for this. Don't forget, the Department of Labor will send out, I like to call them secret shoppers, but, um, you know, individuals who pretend to be applicants who are looking to trip up employers on different regulations. I mean, there are there are endless ambulance chasing firms. Uh, I tease Brian, our good friend Brian Schenker. Uh, there, are, there are many of his brethren in that industry. They will have, they will, they'll ch just simply troll job postings, looking for someone who's not compliant in their posting, apply to the job, catch you in the act, just yep. so they can sue you, right? Yes. Well, so this is this is silly to not be compliant. Uh, I, I think. Well, I think people pretty aren't pretty simple. I think when people aren't compliant, it's mostly out of ignorance. They don't know that law exists. Sometimes yeah. they're like, hey, and this is going to lead me to the second part that I think is maybe the bigger th issue for, for folks. Compliance yeah. is by me. Either you are or you're not. Probably the bigger issue for folks is if, I've, if, if I'm paying 
three people at this job, you know, $80,000 a year for this. And I'm, and the only way I'm going to get somebody new with market value is 100000 And I disclose that. What am I doing with the other three that I got here? I don't want to lose them. Yeah. I, 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 love I, them. I, I I should correct myself. This isn't really easy. I, I'd say the uh, one of the more difficult states, uh, believe it or not, is Colorado. Um, but what employers have been saying to me is, is your issue that you just brought up, which is absolutely a real issue. And then in addition to that is how big of a range can I put? Um, there, there's a lot of nuances to these laws. You really have to talk to a professional about it. I think the compliance side, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier because it's binary. But the real tough conversations that pay transparency laws are how you're going to deal with your current employees if they're making below market value. And it's yes. not some evil, you know, cigar smoking in a boardroom. How do I extract blood from the little man? It's right, right. These things just happen. Market, market conditions change, right? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll move, us, move us along. I'm looking at the clock here. Pay transparency, we talked. How about leave types? You and I have said a million times, this is maybe the fastest growing area of change is leave types, paid leave, not paid leave. Uh, it is. It yeah. is. And, you know, when I was thinking about this, I, I, I just have to give you a little story, which was, you know, my nephew, you know, struggling student working in a restaurant, you know, happy to see him over the holidays. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't get any days off. And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, you do. You know, I, I know what state he was, he, he, he lives in. No. Yeah. I'm like, yes, you do. And he's like, no, I don't. And I was like, yeah, you do. So, you know, the states are passing these laws because there are employers that do not, I, I, it's uncomprehensible to me, but do not give any days off uh, for employees. I've had many of, the, of an employer that I've wrote a handbook for, and I'm like, really? No, no. How do you keep people, right? It, it's astounding to me. But, you know, so again, look, employers, we should be embracing this. Um, for some of these leave laws, the states are giving you um, a portion of the money. Some of these leave laws are partially paid, uh, like New York paid family leave. California paid family leave are partially paid by the employee. So, you know, these are really, um, I think in some cases, necessary laws. Uh, again, employers embrace it. Let's put it on. You know, now it's mandated. I, when I'm helping write an ad, I absolutely put this on an ad because a lot of times the employees don't know that these exist and they should know coming in um, right. This is how we attract people, right? These are, this, these are some of the benefits we should be talking about. The savings plan, you know, giving the salary that, that they can get and talking about the different leaves that individuals can take. And I can tell you that um, look, the handbooks we write take us and we do handbook. We probably do, I'm going to say 20 handbooks a day, Mike. Yep. Um, our handbooks are customized to the industry, to the culture, to the state, to the city, to the federal government, and they can take five hours. And those in need of laws, I will tell you, are probably what take us most of the time. But we want to get it right. We want to make it perfect for that employer, right, to engage, retain um, staff. And, and, and also, you know, make it pretty clear to the employees, you know, what leaves they can take when, when do they come to HR, et cetera. Uh, I mean, this is, um, and no joke, and this isn't self-serving. Um, it, it, this is one of those things you can't rely on ChatGPT or Google because right. you, you need a SHRM certified person. It's too specific. No, it, it, it's so specific and it's so regional, right? It's not like, it's not like, so you got, you got FMLA, right? Um, kind of the CARES Act, you had certain leave types, paid leave, not paid leave. Uh, yeah. Um, but but mostly this is state and local municipalities passing these leave law types. So it's yeah. so specific. It's so regionalized that you got to rely on a professional here. Um, oh, just, yeah. Just general for, for all employers, how should they be thinking about leave in general? Because we could, we could never list all of them on this show. No, 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 we couldn't. 
you know, one thing I do, I do want to bring up, you know, two things. So we know California has lap the laws, right? So they have uh, leave laws, but they added bereavement leave as a mandate. And that's the first state to do that. But we're always talking about New York and California. Minnesota just enacted a paid leave program. So it's, it's pretty spread out across the board. Here's what I'm going to tell you about leaves. When it is a mandated leave, employers need to know when an employee can take it and when they can't. So there, you know, every leave is not applicable to every situation for every employee. Yeah. That's where you get into trouble. When you yeah. start denying leaves and say, no, Mike, you can't take bereavement leave because you can only take it for, for this you know, list of family members and the person you're telling me falls outside of that list, you really need a professional to help you with that because these leave laws talk about fines. These are big fines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, these, and, these are serious. So understanding what forms have to be filled out, how the employee is going to get paid, where the leaves are concurrent, and where they stand alone. So That's some of the really states, important topics. oh my goodness, we could spend hours on this. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think in some big sweeping way, the, the supply of uh, labor and demand for labor uh, in this war for, for, the, for, for talent, this labor shortage, uh, this, this is going to just do that. We talked about this a lot. The war for talent is going to do nothing but continue to get harder for the next 50 years. Yes. The demographics are, are, are baked on this. Baked yes. On rates over the last 30, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So because employers are going to have to do more to attract employees, I think that's almost this supply, demand, and labor kind of fix. Employers are going to be more willing to be uh, flexible when it comes to leave anyway. But again, these, these leave laws can be so specific with certain types of criteria that, hey, if you just took your vacation and the state says that, that you can have this type of leave. It's like, and I didn't know about that. I'm like, okay, you just took two weeks and now you just added three more days and now you had a death in the family and there's this bereavement. I'm a, I'm a small business owner. I, I, I'm out of business if you're gone for a month. I, I can't do it. I can't pay you that much. And so maybe these things happen concurrently and so one nullifies the other. It just gets so complex so fast. You, you gotta get professional opinions. And again, whether it's us or somebody else, you need yes. a certified person because Google and ChatGPT, I love them. They will not point you to authoritative sources. Solid. No, sir. Yeah. All right. Um, two more topics I want to cover here. So uh, cannabis. Marijuana is still illegal federally. Um, uh, if you want to do business, I mean, I know in the, in, in the payroll HR business, uh, the big national banks won't touch cannabis businesses because it's still illegal federally. Now, right. clearly, there's a there's a wave happening of, of of medical and recreational use at the state level. Yeah. But what? How the heck should em employers be thinking about cannabis? And okay, it's not legal in my state. Can people do it at work? Is it off duty? Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. Take us through that. So. <laughs> I, 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 I laugh because, you know, a lot of employers are like, well, it's legal in our state. So Joe's smoking a doobie at lunchtime. What can I do? And I'm like, would you let him take shots of bourbon during his lunch? Right. So I, I try to make it, you know, a, a little easier to understand. And alcohol is legal. But yeah. Right. And alcohol is legal everywhere. But, uh, you know, depending on your age. But so. It does become complex. The testing is complex. So what I need employers to think about and look at and, and talk to me about is what state are you in? You know, do you have any exceptions that you're allowed to test for cannabis? Because there's a lot of states that will not allow you, if you're doing drug testing, to add cannabis to the list. But the new um statutes that I see coming out are about off-duty use, right? So I go on, I'm going to hire Mike Vinoy. I go on your social media and I see that you've got a picture of yourself, um, you know, smoking cannabis, um, you know, and 
you have a line there, you know, that, that that's what you were doing. And I decide not to hire you. There's a lot of states that are now saying you cannot, you know, not hire somebody, right? Or hold them back in any employment situation due to off-duty use of cannabis. And, you know, New York has that that already for, for alcohol, uh, actually, um, as well. So, you know, look, the whole social media thing is a big deal. Um, you know, again, your managers need to be trained on what they can and cannot do um, as far as social media um, and just you know, sort of related here, some states are prohibiting employers from demanding social media in information from candidates and employees. Like, hey, Mike, I need your, you know, Instagram, social media, TikTok. I need to be connected to you there. Many states are prohibiting employers from demanding that information. So a lot to impact to unpack there as well, Mike. Um, so I just, you know, I'm, I'm letting everybody, you know, let's be aware of that, you know, work with us on what you're going to do. What's your go forward plan on testing and, um, off duty use. Yeah. Very good. All right. Last one. Uh, you're saying you, 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 you mentioned that there's a lot of more scrutiny around disability claims. What, what, what do you mean by that? So let me, let me, I'm going to give another example. So we had an employer, they were in, they were a manufacturer. Uh, one of the women on the line was pregnant. Um, her manager very kindly walked over to her and said, Hey Jane, you know, I see, you know, the pregnancy, you're pregnant, you're a little bit difficult. I'm going to take you off the line and I'm going to sit you over there on the chair and I'm going to have you do something else. So you don't, so you don't have to stand. Yeah. Now I know you know what's wrong with that, but I'm 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 guessing that that our listeners are thinking, well, that sounds nice, Mary. What's wrong with that? Yeah. That ended up in a lawsuit, right? Because that could have an impact on Jane's future earnings. So Jane's concern was, you took me off my regular job duties without me asking, and it wasn't behavioral based. Right. It was just because I was pregnant. Yeah. Right. And the same thing could occur, you know, um, for any other physical, um, you know, restriction that somebody would have. Here's what I need everybody to understand. Number one, ads and job description should have physical requirements, even if it's a desk job. And I'm going to say again that your interviewers need to be trained on what they can ask. And your managers have to be trained on how to work with disabilities within the workplace, what they can and cannot say and, and do when it comes to an employee having a disability. I can imagine having this conversation with my 84-year-old father, him just talking about this is what's wrong with the world that you can't help, uh, help out. I mean, the chivalrous intent here is, is obvious, right? I think, I think good HR... Good HR practices kind of point, I always come back to competencies in, in, in skill requirements and in, in job descriptions. If you're- Yeah, any, I, I agree. I mean, listen, the employer, and I've had this situation more than once, believe it or not. Um, and they're like, well, what should I have done? And I said, ask her if she needed a chair to do the current job she was doing. Bingo. I mean, that, that's the- That's pretty easy. But-, okay. but you know, that's where the training comes in, right? That's why we like to train managers in HR 101, yeah. right? Because you don't know what you don't know. Job description, what is required to do this job? What are the competencies and skills required to perform that job? And then everything flows from that. And it's like, you know what? How, how's the pregnancy going? Can I get you a chair? Is there anything we can do to make it, make it more comfortable? I mean, you just ask, you know, but put, put it on the employee and let, let them tell you. And then you can make accommodations all day long, but just ask them. Yeah. Uh, Mary, we're, we're about at time. I, I, yeah. You've been sprinkling in through all seven of these, you know, the, the 
kind of what you should be doing, whether it's an FLSA audit or your job descriptions, or your interview training, big picture without kind of going through each of the seven, what would be some of the big buckets that you would want to be guiding employers about, you know, how they should be thinking, what, what practically can they, should they be doing starting say tomorrow uh, to prepare for these employment law changes? Yeah. And, and you said it definitely, I would get going on a Fair Labor Standards Act audit, right? So you're looking at how you're paying people and classifying people, right? So, so two different things. Um, part of that FLSA audit, I would recommend is, you know, that you should look at some of the EEO um, statistics as well. So if you're pulling a payroll report, don't just look at uh, position and salary, look at position, sex, and if you have any of the EEO, uh, uh, any of the other EEO information, I would look at that. Because if you're going to look at it, let's look at it holistically, not just for the impact uh, due to the raise in salaries, but also is there any disparate impact or, you know, discrimination going on um, on the in the protected classes? Uh, if we talked about a handbook, I would absolutely look at your handbook, your on and off boarding paperwork, um, posting requirements tend to change in the beginning of the year. So I would look at that as well. And don't forget about training your managers. Your managers need to be trained in, in most of the things that we talked about. They're your boots on the ground. They're talking to your employees every day. Best way to keep the company moving forward. And out of a court of law is training your managers. Yeah, I think this is one of the, if I had to pick one place where employers get in trouble, um, the employer may be really well-intentioned, they, 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 but they are unaware of what is happening on their own shop because all of that interaction between the frontline manager and the frontline employee, right? And whether there's cultural issues, there's discrimina discriminatory issues, uh, that's where it all happens and you might just be blind to it. And so, uh, I can probably think of no better advice for employers for 2024 than, you know, certainly we'd love to help you, but however you get your help, that you train your frontline managers, you train your management staff on best class, best practices in HR. Agreed. Any final words that you want to give everyone in the, if they're on a mission to grow their business in 2024, Mary? You just keep focusing on HR. It's, it's no longer a cost center. It is your, your way to be successful, right? Um, so keep focusing on HR as, as a way to help you grow um, and, and not, you know, and not something that you have to worry about, right? Um, you know, keep watching our webinars. We'll take the worry out of, uh, yeah. out of that equation. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you need a team. So with that, until next week's episode, uh, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to everybody else. That's it for this episode of Mission to Grow. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and more episodes, visit us at missiontogrow.com. If you found this content valuable, I invite you to share it with a friend and subscribe to the show. If you really want to help, I'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Mission to Grow is sponsored by Assure. Assure helps more than 100,000 businesses get access to capital, stay compliant, and develop the talent they need to grow. To learn more about how Assure can help your business grow, visit assuresoftware.com. Until next time.